a classic English suburb. A refuge for commuters of all sorts. <laughs> I'm here to visit Mark and Jane Glanville. They run a sanctuary for Swifts. Oh my good grief! <laughs> When they said you had a few Swift boxes, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't expecting well, that. <laughs> the car. <laughs> listen, listen. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Mark Swift's been coming here for 15 years. It's like having an air show in your garden every day yeah, for, for free. free. Yeah. <laughs> Because they come back to my house, I, I treat them as my birds, and they become part of the family. You worry about them, you, you, you look forward to when they come, and, and, it, you, and you're like a parent, it's like, where are they? They're late, and, and I just love them. They make a perilous journey from Africa, where they spend the winter. But this year, they arrive late, some not at all. This year's been a weird one, right? It's been a strange year this year. People were emailing me in, um, in May saying, where's our Swifts? What happened was an onslaught of unseasonable weather. In May in, in southern York, they had their, their worst weather for about 50 years. Loads of, loads of swifts died where they came up exhausted from, from Africa. When they did get back to us, we had a terrible June. It, it rained, it was cold and wet. England's swift population has halved since 1995. A big factor is the loss of nesting sites. Most modern homes aren't as accommodating as the Glanvilles. But there are concerns, too, about the impact of climate change. <laughs> now, garden birds like uh, Rob the Robin here generally doing OK because they can kind of roll with the changes that the climate's throwing at them. The problem starts when you're dealing with migrant birds, the birds that are travelling to us from another country because they time their arrival specifically to make the most of a natural bounty, such as the abundance of caterpillars. But shifting seasons mean those juicy insects are hatching earlier. Fine for birds that live here all year round, but some long-distance species, like willow warbler and pied flycatcher, are arriving too late. Mark keeps careful notes about his swifts and then sends them to the bird charity, the British Trust for Ornithology. This sort of citizen science has given the trust an insight into how climate change might be affecting the natural world. The BTO analysed 50 years of data for Inside Out and found in London species like the swift, starling and missile thrush were especially vulnerable and in decline. Whereas many garden and woodland birds such as the great tit, chiffchaff and blackcap are benefiting from our milder winters. One species that's really struggling is the curlew. It needs wet, boggy moorland to breed. But some farming practices are drying this landscape out. And there are concerns climate change could make things worse. In the south of England, the plight of the curlew is desperate. In some places, such as Dartmoor and Devon, they are close to extinction. But here in the Peak District, they're just about hanging on. I'm meeting James Pierce Higgins from the BTO. He says upland birds are moving north to find the conditions they need to survive. Species like the curlew, like the golden plover, you know, they're being negatively impacted by warmer temperatures, amongst other things. We're seeing you know, the bird communities around us reshuffling as a result of the changes that, you know, that we see. Species are shifting their distribution uh, at, a, at a pace of three, three or more kilometres a year. Um, you know, they, they, these impacts are real. What the curlews need is a fighting chance. PhD student Leah Kelly is working on a plan. Well, this is what the cold face of curlew conservation looks like. Isn't yes, it? indeed. So what are you doing? So I'm measuring the compactness and the hardness of the soil using this soil penetrometer. Um, and this is because curlew probe the soil to find all the insects and the worms that they feed on. 
So I'm trying to look at how hard the soil is to see whether they can access these invertebrates, because if it's too hard, they just won't be able to feed. Ah, so this amazing looking bit of the kit is basically yeah. a, a false curly head. Yes, definitely. Let's see it in action then. Okay. When the soil's too dry, worms retreat beyond the length of a curlew's bill. This probably would be too hard for a curlew. Too dry for a curlew. Yeah. So what is here for the curlews to feed on? <laughs> Never mind whether a curlew can penetrate the soil. I can't get me spade in. Turns out, not much. So if it dries out, you lose a key part of the dinner of a curlew. Leah's research will help another bird charity, the RSPB, work with farmers to restore patches of land so it's more like this, packed with worms. So if you can try and you know, make the habitat as suitable as it can be for them in the face of climate change, then you give, we're giving them a better chance to survive. And that's exactly what they've done at the Nip Estate in West Sussex, on a huge scale. Once an intensive crop and dairy farm, it now looks more like African scrubland. It's an English safari. No lions, but plenty of turtle doves. Completely astonishing. I don't think anybody could have predicted that we'd get turtle doves back here. Owner Isabella Tree and her conservationist Penny Green work hard to ensure that NEP is a place where struggling species of all shapes and sizes can thrive. It can offer a food resource for a turtle dove with tiny little legs like that. And then you've got the other extreme with a stork with legs like that. Um, and they're both finding their niches here and, and all the food that they need. 17 years ago, Isabella and her husband decided to stop draining their exhausted soil, quit their struggling farm and return the land to nature. You're trying to bring back dynamism into the landscape and being very hands-off, so you're letting nature perform, letting nature do its thing, really. Free-roaming animals, like Tamworth pigs and Exmoor ponies, keep trees and foliage from taking over. They rootle the earth, spreading seeds and nutrients. We need to have breeding hotspots like this one so that our our wildlife can be resilient into the future. There are now a growing number of similar rewilding projects across the country. It's a wonderful feeling of connection, you know, when you can actually hear a turtle dove doing that tour touring in the thickets beside you. It, it just brings joy to the heart. It's, it's amazing. NEP and the other projects we've seen are helping to prop up threatened birds and other species in the face of a rapidly transforming world. But for how long? Birds are incredible creatures. They're adaptable and resilient, but only to a point. Their sensitivity to changing habitats, changing weather and a changing climate sounds a warning to us all. And we need to listen to that. <laughs>